शिकागो क्लासिफिकेशन वर्शन 4.0 वर्शन 4.0 सो इन दिस क्लासिफिकेशन द इसोफेजल मोटिलिटी डिसऑर्डर्स आर क्लासिफाइड इनटू टू ब्रॉड ग्रुप्स द ग्रुप नंबर वन एंड ग्रुप नंबर टू सो इन ग्रुप नंबर वन वी हैव कंडीशंस वेयर द मीडियन इंटीग्रेटेड रिलैक्सेशन प्रेशर मीडियन इंटीग्रेटेड रिलैक्सेशन प्रेशर इज एलिवेटेड ओके वॉट इज मीडियन इंटीग्रेटेड रिलैक्सेशन प्रेशर more on that i have discussed on the evaluation of esophageal disorder so please go through that it's one of the finding that labs uh, that that the softwares calculate and give you when you do a high resolution manometry you get a topographic color coded image along with that some data one of the data point is median integrated relaxation pressure basically integrated relaxation pressure all high resolution manometries are done for 10 swallows so the median is what you are taking right median integrated relaxation pressure is elevated now what do i mean by elevated when i say elevated it means it is more than 15 mm of mercury that's what we call as elevated median integrated relaxation pressure right okay now you have another set of esophageal motility disorder where the median irp is normal is not elevated it stays normal that means it is going to be less than 15 mm of mercury so the conditions where the median irp is elevated basically you can call them as esophago gastric junction obstruction disorders or the disorders of esophago gastric junction obstruction now what are the disorders that can be classified under this heading obviously we are talking about we are talking about achalasia so that figures in here like i did define it saying that there is impaired relaxation of the lower esophageal sphincter so that's why the median integrated relaxation pressure is elevated here right so achalasia cardia comes in here okay then you also have esophago gastric junction outlet obstruction outlet obstruction that's a second category of disorder that would come under the esophago gastric junction obstruction okay outlet obstruction and achalasia cardia on the other hand the disorders where the median irp is normal these can be called as disorders of peristalsis disorders of peristalsis so what are the disorders that we can classify under this heading okay well you can consider your diffuse esophageal spasm as a typical example of the disorder of peristalsis then you have this nutcracker esophagus nutcracker esophagus then you also have jack hammer esophagus jack hammer esophagus all of these are the disorders of peristalsis so here the lower esophageal sphincter does not experience major abnormalities it is only the esophageal body through which the movement is supposed to happen or the peristalsis is supposed to happen is experiencing abnormality right that is second set so if i give you a hrm or high resolution manometry data your eye should first search for where is the data about the median integrated relaxation pressure right because that helps you to categorize these two sets of disorders and once you have classified it as achalasia the achalasia can be further categorized into three types type 1 which is called as classical achalasia then you have type 2 and then you have type 3 which is also called as vigorous achalasia so type 1 is our classical achalasia then you have type 2 and you also have type 3 which is called as vigorous achalasia all this classification is based on high resolution manometry probably when i show you the high resolution manometry images you will have a better understanding of what is it but for now remember achalasia cardia is classified into three categories based on hrm data right okay now this is the chicago classification we begin the high resolution manometry okay let me give you a brief idea about what we do in high resolution manometry basically patient is asked to swallow and he is also asked to swallow a tube which contains multiple pressure transducer transducers and it is positioned till the lower end of the esophagus like it it is positioned beyond the les and the pressure changes happening in in those different areas are transmitted to an outside device which is basically your computer now the data coming from it when you are swallowing the data coming from it is captured by the software and it is fed back to you in the form of a colored topographic image okay so what you get in the images you will see 
a graphical representation on your x axis and y axis okay so on your x x axis you basically have time expressed in terms of seconds in terms of seconds seconds from the beginning of swallowing till the lower esophageal sphincter opens up and the food bolus is transferred from the esophagus to the stomach okay so over time the pressure changes in the esophagus are plotted on the x axis and on the y axis what we plan is what we plot is the distance from your upper esophageal sphincter so you have the representation of upper esophageal sphincter somewhere here on the plot i'll show you the real image but now you have a mental idea of it so somewhere here it is representation of the upper esophageal sphincter okay so let me say at 0 seconds the upper esophageal sphincter opens then that opening of upper esophageal sphincter that pressure change you will notice here okay after the upper esophageal sphincter is open this is your esophagus this is where you have a upper esophageal sphincter this is where you have a lower esophageal sphincter and then this is your stomach and this is your body of the esophagus which can be divided into cervical thoracic and lower esophagus now once the food bolus reaches here the upper esophageal sphincter should open or in other words it should relax right so that pressure change you will be seeing now normally in a resting state what happens to the upper esophageal sphincter it is closed so it has some amount of pressure it is definitely not going to be zero right so that pressure should lower when the food bolus reaches the top end of the upper esophageal sphincter so that it opens and the food bolus starts making its move into the esophagus once it starts traveling through the esophagus we also know that when the peristalsis is happening behind the bolus there is a contraction appearing right behind the bolus you will see a contraction appearing and outside in front of the bolus there is will be a relaxation so that the bolus is propelled forward that's what we call as peristalsis so this contraction would also mean that at particular point in the esophagus at that particular time during the swallowing the pressure is going up so that will be visible on your plot so let me say just giving you a hypothetical number 0.5 seconds after the swallowing right if 0.5 seconds after the swallowing this is where the swallowing started let me say that as a 0 second 0.5 seconds after the swallowing if the food bolus has reached at this point of time then you will see from the upper esophageal sphincter let me say 2 cm or 3 cm down the line rise in pressure because behind the bolus there is a contraction force rise in pressure so this distance from the upper esophageal sphincter in terms of centimeters is plotted here on the y axis so as the food bolus keeps moving we are moving in time and we are moving in space the food bolus is moving in space and we are moving in time so the net result will be the pressure keeps going up in this shape right because at let me say at uh, point 0.7 pi second this is where like somewhere here the esophagus contracted at let me say 1 second somewhere here the esophagus contracted let me say 2 seconds it is here where the esophagus contracted so in the plot it would look like this that the the waveform would be traversing like this because we are moving in time and somewhere in the bottom of the plot there is representation for the lower esophageal sphincter right as the food bolus is coming closer to lower esophageal sphincter what should happen to the ileus it should open so that the food bolus easily moves into the stomach so ileus should relax so even at the rest we all know lower esophageal sphincter has it should be closed so it has some amount of pressure so that it doesn't allow the regurgitation of gastric content back into the esophagus right so as the food bolus is approaching the lower esophageal sphincter it should relax so the pressure should drop so there is some amount of resting pressure in the lower esophageal sphincter and as the food bolus starts coming here somewhere here you will start noticing the drop in the pressure of the lower esophageal sphincter that's this is how your uh, manometry result is going to look now how do i know the change in the pressure well the pressure in these different zones are color coded in the sense on the plot when you see blue that means the pressure is very close to zero okay as the intensity of color starts increasing the pressure is higher for example next to blue you would probably see some degree of yellow uh, before that you will see green which is little higher pressure yellow is little more higher pressure then you will see orange which is more higher in pressure then you would see red 
and finally purple purple shows extremely high pressures red shows high pressure orange relatively high pressure in comparison to blue and green so at rest probably your upper esophageal sphincter and your lower esophageal sphincter may be giving you a red streak on the plot uh, not not the red streak the green streak on the plot because of having some resting pressure being there but when it relaxes that green streak or slight yellow streak would disappear towards blue that means the sphincter has relaxed let me show you an image probably that will give you a better idea about esophageal manometry okay so this is a manometry image this is not of a normal swallow you can probably see here the upper esophageal sphincter being represented and you can here see the lower esophageal sphincter right all this blue means the pressure is close to zero but here in the lower esophageal sphincter location pressure is little on the higher side you can see a mix of green and yellow right and then here it is upper esophageal sphincter where also you see a mix of uh, green and yellow in the resting state so when swallowing began this is where you see the pressure drop to zero close to zero that means the upper esophageal sphincter opened right after that what i expect is with the passage of time the pressure here should keep increasing with the passage of time so that the foot bolus reaches the lower esophageal sphincter and somewhere here i would expect to see the drop in the pressure again here i would expect to see bluish color so that means that lower esophageal sphincter effectively opened in this uh, topographic image i don't see that that means this is abnormal right we will discuss more about the abnormality i hope you got a gist of it what i'm trying to tell you right okay so that's how we classify the achalasia we diagnose and classify the achalasia based on based on high resolution manometry okay so how do we classify we begin with the 10 wet swallows we plot as i showed you right from those plots first thing we need to know is the median integrated relaxation pressure don't bo bother too much about what is it right none of us sit and calculate it. it it comes from the computer data integrated relaxation pressure this is not same as the resting lower esophageal sphincter pressure okay now once you have done that if it is normal then what is the classification we already are thinking of a esophageal motility disorder we have done the high resolution manometry and the median integrated relaxation pressure is less than 15 mm of mercury that means normal then we are thinking of disorders of peristalsis most likely right but if it is abnormal let me say it is abnormal more than 15 mm of mercury it is elevated then we are thinking of disorders of esophagogastric junction obstruction either achalasia or the outlet obstruction right so then what we will see is whether the peristaltic activity was there For we saw the integrated relaxation pressure which is concerned about lower esophageal sphincter but now i want to see what is happening with the body as patient makes a swallowing attempt whether the peristaltic movements the change in the pressure appear on the topograph or not if 100% of the swallows are showing no peristaltic activity right or they show there is premature peristaltic activity 100% absent peristalsis in all of the peristalsis then you are strongly thinking of achalasia strongly thinking of achalasia you will get little more data from the resolution manometry if there is 100% failed peristalsis without any pan esophageal pressurization in the sense when you do the resolution manometry what you notice is the upper esophageal sphincter relaxes the food enters into the esophagus but esophagus doesn't show any peristaltic changes like this the the esophageal pressure is not showing that typical peristaltic rise in pressure at different point of time in different portion of the esophagus and your lower esophageal sphincter is not relaxing well but in this segment right you don't see any kind of peristaltic activity then you will call it as achalasia cardia type 1 or which is also called as classic or classical achalasia cardia but here you don't see any pressure building up in the esophagus there is no pan esophageal pressurization okay now moving on to type 2 here also you will see 100% failed peristalsis but at least 20% of the swallows that means we did 10 swallows right so at least two of the swallows show that there is build up of pressure in the esophagus because absent peristalsis and the water column that is see remember we are making wet swallow so basically patient is swallowing liquid here so that column of water that he is swallowing 
it's stuck between upper esophageal sphincter and lower esophageal sphincter and that builds up the pressure right throughout the esophagus not to the point where there are esophageal contractions visible but pressure inside the esophagus increases this is what we call as pan esophageal pressurization so out of 10 swallows at least two or in other words 20% of the swallows patient is showing pan esophageal pressurization along with the absence of peristalsis anyway median integrated pressure would already be high so the lower esophageal relaxation is impaired that we call as type 2 achalasia now we also have a type 3 achalasia where apart from this 100% failed peristalsis at least 20% or more of the swallows show premature contractions premature contractions which are kind of spasmodic kind of contractions which are not peristaltic they are not uh, effective in pushing the bolus further down into the esophagus but randomly there is uh, spasmodic contractions occurring that is what we call as type 3 achalasia this is also called as vigorous achalasia vigorous achalasia cardia remember type 1 is classic and type 3 is vigorous achalasia cardia clear so this is the classification of the achalasia cardia and how we interpret the high resolution manometry